encouraging uh, to see all of you who are here, here. Um, this is a very special day of the year. It's a special day for family, and there are probably a lot of people who would not want to be out doing what we're doing right now. Uh, they'd much rather just be with their families, but there's really nothing more important that we could be doing than what we're doing right now, which is praising the Lord and worshiping His name. And so it's encouraging to see those who are here, here. I uh, want to make a couple of comments before I jump into uh, the lesson, uh, a couple of corrections. Uh, first of all, in the class earlier, I said that I would, my family and I would be missing three services, uh, but, and that's kind of what I had been planning, but that's actually not going to happen. We're going to be missing only two services, and we will be back on Wednesday, January 4th. Um, so Phil is already scheduled to be teaching the Bible class on that day, and we're just going to keep that scheduled that way, but that's our plan. Secondly, I made a mistake in my sermon this morning that I wanted to point out. In Luke 2.14, uh, when the angels were praising God after Jesus was born, um, I pointed out that the angels did not say glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, as we have been accustomed to hearing it. However, there are versions that render it uh, that way. I read that from the New King James Version. Uh, what I should have said is that in the original Greek, the emphasis is actually slightly different than the version we're used to hearing, and that it's rendered correctly, I think, in the New American Standard, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among men with whom He is pleased. There's a nuance there, and I think that's the correct rendering of, of what the Greek says, but I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, so that I don't uh, have a hard time sleeping tonight feeling like I said something that was inaccurate. So tonight we're going to be studying uh, from John 8. So turn your Bibles to John chapter 8, if you will. John chapter 8. This is the final lesson in this month's theme of victory in lighting the world. And uh, it's also, uh, obviously, it's the final sermon of this year, and thus it's the final sermon of this theme we've had for 2016, uh, which is More Than Conquerors. And so what I want to talk to you about, which I think is going to be a good way to sum, sum up 2016 and, and a good lesson to leave the year out on, but also to sum up this month's theme, especially is Jesus, the light of the world. In Matthew 5... Jesus said, you are the light of the world, talking about us. But in John 8, 12, let's read that. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. 
He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Christ followers are the light of life in one sense, but in another sense, there's only one light of this world, and that is Jesus the Christ. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to try to preach from this one verse. I had a conversation with Brian recently, and he said that he heard a preacher who sometimes he'll preach a whole sermon from one verse, and uh, I thought, now that's a challenge. I'm going to use other, other verses, but this is going to serve as our outline, John 8, 12, and we're simply going to make two basic points. Uh, Christ Himself is the light, and then we're going to look at the blessing of Christ's light. But let's set up the context uh, first. Jesus, when He said this, was in Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, which was uh, to commemorate the years when the Israelites lived in tabernacles or booths in the wilderness. It was a time to celebrate the end of the harvest, to remember their sins, uh, to offer sacrifices on the Day of Atonement, which kicked off the whole feast. For six nights, the women's court in the temple, the most public part of the temple, was illuminated with four large golden candelabra, each with four large golden bowls. And since the Feast of the Tabernacles memorialized the wilderness wanderings, the illumination was meant as a symbol of the pillar of fire that had been the night guide of the Israelites in the wilderness. So there's all this symbolism going on as a backdrop for Jesus' statement. And according to the Midrash of the Jews, the reason that the court was brilliantly lighted was a symbol that God would kindle for them the great light in the days of the Messiah. It was all in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, the great light. The rabbis also spoke of the, quote, original light in which they believed God had wrapped Himself as a garment. According to, to them, it was from this light that the sun, moon, and stars had been kindled. They said that this light was then reserved under the throne of God and waiting until the days of the Messiah, and whose day that light would shine forth once more. So there's all this messianic anticipation uh, going on during this temple. Jesus entered into the temple area um, in the middle of the eight-day feast and began teaching back in chapter 7 and in verse 14. It says, But when it was now in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. Beginning in chapter 7 and verse 37, Jesus taught on the last day of the feast, urging the people to come to Him, to believe in Him. And by the time we get to chapter 8 and verse 12, it's still that last day of the feast. And according to chapter 8 and verse 20, He was standing in, in the treasury. It says in verse 20, these words He spoke in the treasury as He taught in the temple. And the treasury was near the court of women, which was brilliantly lit and illuminated at this time. And I have read that on this final day that the, the illumination actually wasn't still going on in that day. So it could have been that instead of the illumination of the light being the backdrop, that it might have been the, the ex extinguished light. And for that to provide uh, an even more powerful backdrop for Jesus to say, these lights are out, I'm the true light, in, 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 in essence. So, first, He says, I am the light of the world. So let's focus on this simple fact that Christ Himself is the light. And brethren, this is going to be a lesson that is basic, and it's going to be a lesson that just maybe encourages us with things that we already know, but I think you'll learn some new things as we go along. It's helped me in my mind in thinking of God, and in praising God, and in praising God for the Messiah. Jesus was saying that He Himself is that great light which was symbolized by the illumination of the court of women. In other words, He was saying in very clear terms in their mind, when He said, I am the light of the world, He was saying, I am the Messiah. According to tradition, light was one of the names of the Messiah. And I think it's ironic 
that during this time of year, people put up lights. This time of year that is supposed to be focused upon the Messiah and His birth. And there's lights all over the place. Light was one of the names of the Messiah. There are many passages that prophesied of the light of of the Messiah. For example, and most prominently, Isaiah 9 and verse 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Jesus was also saying, when He said, I am the light of the world, that He is that original light which the Jews believed God once wrapped Himself with. Jesus was saying, I am that original light. That light which you believe was reserved under the throne of God until the days of the Messiah. It's me! And I'm shining forth once more not to provide literal light to the earth, but to provide spiritual light to the lost and dying world. It is a very rich idea. I want you to to just flip over to John 1. and We're very familiar with John 1 and verse 1. And verse 14, which are connected, and we, we talked about that a little bit this morning. I quoted it. But I would like for us just, just to think of this verse in a different way. We're going to replace the word word with the word light. Verse 1, In the beginning was the light, and the light was with God, and the light was God. Now verse 14, And the light became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and while we're here let's read verses four through nine in him was life and the life was the light of men the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it there came a man sent from god whose name was john He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but He came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So Jesus was that original light. In addition to these things, Jesus was also saying that He is the fulfillment of the pillar of fire... In the wilderness, in Exodus 13, we read the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. You see, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire was a physical manifestation of divine presence. The pillar of fire guided as well as protected the Israelite pilgrims in the wilderness. Jesus is the everlasting pillar of fire that guides His pilgrim followers who are surrounded by darkness and are on our way to the promised land. Jesus said, I am the light. I am the light of the world. Notice that he didn't say, I am a light. Not like the sun is a light of this this planet and the moon is another one and the stars each are individual lights. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Not only of the temple or of Jerusalem or of Judea or of the Jewish nation, but the light of the entire world. In fact, the Greek word there is cosmos, which is the entire creation, everything in this universe that God made. Jesus is the light of the world. Without Him, there is no light, there is no direction, there is no hope, and there is no salvation. That's what Jesus was saying, and that's what I believe to be the truth. Jesus' light is far brighter than, than the pillar of fire or than the illumination of the court of women. It was even brighter than the sun. It's it's interesting when Paul was on his way to Damascus and he saw the vision of Jesus who appeared in light. It was so bright that it blinded Paul. And in in Acts 26, 13, it mentions that the brightness was even brighter than the noonday sun. And that was 
In a sense, it was something literal he saw with his eyes. But think of that in a spiritual way. We, we can't even fathom the spiritual light of Jesus Christ. I almost wish that our eyes could be opened and, and like we could see the spiritual realm and see just how magnificent and bright that light really is. So let's focus now for the rest of the lesson on the blessing of Christ's light. The blessing of Christ's light. Jesus said, He who follows me will not walk in the darkness. Darkness is scary. I remember as a kid, my, one of my next door neighbors, I had a next door neighbor on one side of my house and a next door neighbor on the other side, and I was right between them. So uh, the one that was kind of on the back of my house uh, was my cousin Daniel Willingham and his family. Well, there was a little patch of woods between my house and his house, and there was a trail that kind of ran between there, and I would go over to his house in the daytime, and we'd be playing and hanging out, and then it would get dark. And this happened over and over. And I didn't have a flashlight. I was never prepared. You know, we didn't have iPhones back then with a flashlight on there. It was just me in the darkness. And I actually just remember standing at the back porch and just staring across towards my house. And here are these, these woods I have to go through. And I was scared out of my mind every time. And so I would run. I would just, it, it was a dead sprint, as fast as I could, all the way through that patch of woods. And in my mind, there was a monster chasing me. And the faster I ran, the closer that monster got to my heels until I finally got to the safety of the back door of my house and slammed the door safe from the monster. I mean, I did that over and over. So darkness, you, you can relate. It's scary because you can't see things that might be lurking around the corner. But the idea of fear is not really the idea given in, in Scripture about this darkness we're talking about here. It's, it's much more profound than just something to be afraid of. In Scripture, darkness is associated with sin. Do not associate with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, Ephesians 5.11. It is associated with death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and darkness thirdly is associated with ignorance Ephesians 4:18 being darkened in their understanding being darkened in their understanding without Christ's light we would be hopelessly lost in sin and death and would be darkened in our understanding aimlessly guided by our own impulses Jeremiah 10 23, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his own steps. Many people think that they've got life figured out, that they're on the right path. We've all been there and done that. We think we can figure this out on our own. But the light that is in them is actually darkness. Jesus said in Luke eleven thirty five, 35, then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. Without Christ's light, we wouldn't know where we were going spiritually. And we would be destined to miss the way. Look in John 12 and 35 and 36. John 12, verses 35 and 36. Powerful passage here. So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Have you ever gotten lost in the dark? Maybe you're on a camping trip. Some of you guys like to camp a lot. And uh, maybe you were with a group of friends and you got off the trail somehow, went to check something out, and then came back and your friends were gone, and here you are. You don't know which way to turn. You don't have a compass. You're just out here in the darkness, in the woods. Or maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you've been driving at night, one of these really dark nights, and maybe your headlights went out, and you just were, were utterly hopeless of being able to get yourself anywhere. If you can't relate to any of that, I bet you can relate to this. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night, in your own bedroom, on one of these pitch dark nights, and you had all the lights off in your house, and suddenly your bedroom, which formerly was a place you, you could uh, pretty well get around in, and you, you knew, 
Now it was just like a maze of obstacles and, and things for you to stub your toe on. We've all experienced that. You know, it might be surprising to realize how dependent we are on light for almost everything that we do. It's the only way we can see anything. And in preparing for this lesson, I've been thinking about light spiritually, but also physically. How many times do we stop in prayer and say, thank you, God, for light? I've started doing that because I've realized it'd be kind of hard to do anything. Everything would stop if we didn't have any light at all. Even a small amount of light is better than no light. With just a small sliver of light coming under your doorway, you could at least your eyes could adjust to the darkness some and you could kind of manage to get around a little bit. But if there was no light, not, not an ounce of light, I know you don't measure light by ounces, but you, you, you just you wouldn't be able to do anything. You know, imagine having no light at all, like the Egyptians during the ninth plague. Darkness that could be felt, Exodus 10, 21. Have you ever been in darkness like that? Maybe you're in a cave or something like that. I see some heads nodding. And uh, I remember being in a play. Uh, not in the play, but going to this play that they took you from room to room. And we, we got to experience um, this. We got to experience what heaven would be like and, and then what hell would be like. And we went into this dark room and they closed off all the light. It was one of the, one of the most terrifying moments of, of my life. You panic when you can't see anything. So you ever been in darkness? It was so dark, it was almost like it could be felt. That's what it's like spiritually to not have Christ. Do you remember what that was like when you didn't have Christ? And you thought, what's life about? What's the point? You had no direction in life. That's darkness. That's darkness. And ironically... Even though Christ, the light of the world, has come, most of the world is still living in darkness. Ephesians 4 and verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. So many people are needlessly lost without Christ, stubbornly refusing the light that is so readily available. You can go to the thrift store and buy a Bible for a quarter. But people don't read their Bibles. They reject what the Word of God says. It would be like walking through a landmine and it's pitch dark and someone offers you a light, a flashlight, and you say, no thanks. I got this landmine on my own. Even worse... Many believers refuse to walk in Christ's light. Their lives look just like the world. The way they talk is just like the world. Their priorities are just like the world. The way they dress is just like the world. And so they're rejecting the, the light of Christ. That would be like walking through a landmine and accepting the flashlight, but then refusing to turn it on. So we've got this light. It's accessible to us. It's here to guide our feet and we don't even turn it on. We don't even look to see what the Word of God tells us of how to live and what to do and where to go. But Christ's followers are delivered, you see, from this darkness. Jesus says, They who follow me shall not walk in darkness. The Greek is in its strongest form. It really literally says, Shall by no means walk in darkness. Or that's really the literal idea. The very possibility is excluded by the, uh, from the thought that is conditional. If we are following the light of Christ, there is no possible way that we could miss the way. What a tremendous blessing. Christ followers have the light of life. So we've been looking at this blessing from a negative point of view. I want to look at it now in positive terms. Jesus says... They will have the light of life. We will have the light of life as a guide for our feet. Though we are traversing the barren wilderness of this life on our journey to the promised land, we have a constant light to guide our path, to guide our feet. 
You know, if you don't know where you're stepping, it's hard to go anywhere. You got to see where you're stepping first and foremost. Have you ever, in the middle of the night, stepped on a Lego barefooted? You want to talk about pain. That hurts. We got to see where our feet are going. I stumbled on this beautiful verse in Luke 1, this beautiful passage, Luke 1, 78 and 79, spoken by Zacharias after John was born and, his, and, and, and Zacharias' lips, his tongue was loosed and he is praising God for the coming of his son and he also praises God for the Messiah who is coming. In this passage he says, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That is so beautiful. In this passage, Jesus is pictured as a sunrise. It's like you've been waiting all night through the long, dark, difficult night, not knowing where to go, and so you're just stuck. But then the long-awaited morning comes, and over the horizon comes this sunrise. And what does a sunrise do for us? It gives us hope, right? It's beautiful, and it gives us joy and a new beginning, and it also gives us light so we can actually see where we're stepping and where we're going. Another passage that comes to mind is Psalm 119, 105, that the Word of God, Thy Word, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, as Jason did a very good job leading that, that song earlier. So the Word of God is a guide for our feet. Well, remember in John 1 and verse 1 and verse 14, what is Jesus described as? The Word. He is the Word that is the lamp unto our feet. Without Christ's light is our guide. I mean, with Christ's light is our guide. We know exactly where we are. We know exactly where we're going, and we know exactly how to get there, even though we're surrounded by darkness. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Christ followers have the light of life as a possession within. The one who follows Christ is not only guided by Christ's light, but through participating in the messianic life, actually possesses Christ's light within. And thus, as Jesus said in the passage we looked at earlier in John 12, 36, where He said, Believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. It becomes within us. John 1, 9, as we saw earlier as well, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. It enters us. The pillar of fire in the Old Testament was external. But the ultimate and superior light of Jesus, however, is internal, entering our souls and dwelling within. Jesus says, you are the light of the world, but the only way we can be the light of the world is if Jesus' light enters us and enables us to be illuminated. Also, Christ followers have the light, the light unto eternal life. Jesus promises that His followers, not just that they will have the light, but that they will have the light of life. Light and life are connected. As Brian talked about in the first sermon of this month, when he talked about the fact that the sun brings life, it brings warmth, it causes growth of the plants. I mean, without the sun, there could be no life. And so spiritually, the light of Jesus brings life. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, John 1 and verse 4. Having the light of life means having Jesus. And having Jesus means possessing eternal life. It's interesting. The word life is found in John's Gospel more than in any other book in the Bible. And the phrase eternal life is found in John's Gospel way more than in any other book in the Bible. It's found 17 times. The closest is 1 John. is found six times. Therefore, the Gospel of John, the Gospel emphasizing the divinity of Jesus, uses His divinity to highlight over and over that the Son of God came to bring life and life 
abundantly. But we must follow Christ in order to have the blessing. Numbers 9 describes the total control of the Israelites' travels by the cloud. When it was taken up, they journeyed. When it settled down, they encamped. As long as it lay spread over the tabernacle, there they stayed. They had to be constantly prepared to load up and follow that light and follow that cloud. They didn't know when it was going to lead and, and, and lift and lead them, but they had to always be ready for that. One commentator writes, Do not let the warmth by the campfire or the pleasantness of the shady place where your tent is pitched keep you there when the cloud lifts. Be ready for change. Be ready for continuance because you are in fellowship with your leader and commander. You see, the blessing is given to those who follow Christ's light, not those who precede it. Not those who say, well, here's a pillar of fire. I'm going to go before it. I'll find my own way. I'm going to blaze my own trail. No, the trail has already been blazed. It's already been figured out. We just have to follow our leader, Jesus the Christ. And so the question is, do you follow Christ? I talked about in my sermon last week that suppose we took the word Christian and, and eliminated it from, from the English vocabulary and replaced it with Christ follower. Sometimes people wear the name Christian as a badge when they don't really seek to follow Christ. And we might tend to do that. But do we really follow Him? Follow in His footsteps, as 1 Peter 2.21 points out. What a blessing it is that God has made a way for us to be freed from the domain of darkness. Colossians 1.13 For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. And ultimately, if we follow Jesus, we will be saved from the outer darkness where there is weeping, and gnashing of teeth. And we will dwell in the presence of God. In His immediate presence. We will dwell in His light, which no man has seen or can see. But in heaven we will see it. We will dwell in His immediate presence. Jesus is described as the light of the world, but Jehovah is described in Revelation as the light of heaven. Revelation 22, 5, and there will there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. It's a beautiful thought to, to picture basking in the eternal sunlight of, of God, His glory. It's kind of unfathomable. But you want to talk about victory. You want to talk about more than conquerors. That's victory. Would you bow your head with me in a word of prayer? Our Father God, we, we do praise your name. We thank you for your Son who is the light of the world. We're so thankful that he came into the world and thankful that he led the way and showed us the path to follow and that he illumines our path and that he enables us to, to be luminaries ourselves. We pray and ask that you would strengthen us, that we would follow in his footsteps, and that we would guide the way for others to know the way to walk, that we would lead people ultimately to that eternal pil pillar of fire, which is Jesus the Christ. It is through him that we pray. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention. Take your songbooks and turn to the song that has been selected. If you're not a Christian, then you can certainly become one and have direction for your life, have light, have a guide, and therefore have hope. You can become a Christian tonight by believing in the Lord, by repenting of your sins, confessing His name, and being baptized, and continuing to obey the gospel. And in the end, if you do that, you will be saved by the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've not been following in that way, you've not been living as you should, then we'd love to pray with you. If you'd come now as we stand and sing the song of invitation.